Okay, so that's somewhat long introduction. Uh, bear with me because after this it gets really, really good. <laughs> um, brief outline of the rest of the discussion. Brief bio for myself. Second, density is green. Third, I'll debunk a few energy myths. And finally, I'll discuss natural gas to nuclear, the path that I believe offers the best no regrets policy for the U.S. as we go forward and indeed for the rest of the world as we develop, further develop our energy and power delivery systems. Now, since I have the microphone, it's my prerogative, the speaker's prerogative, to introduce a few people uh, because without them, I wouldn't be standing up here. Um, first, I have to introduce my friends from public affairs, uh, Susan Weinberg, Tessa Shanks, and uh, Lisa Kaufman. In particular, I have to introduce Lisa. She is my editor. She's edited all four of my books. I'm an okay writer. Okay. I'm a pretty good rewriter. That's Michener, James Michener's line. Lisa worked with Michener when she lived in Texas a long time ago. Michener said, I'm an okay writer. I'm a pretty good rewriter. Lisa sometimes makes me awful mad by saying, well, you have to rewrite it. But she has an incredible ability to understand the manuscript that I thought was absolutely perfect, what it needs to make it work. And she's done that consistently. And so I've, I've had a little bit of success as a writer, but it is largely due to my friend Lisa Kaufman. My agent Dan Green is here. Um, he has been wonderful. Um, I trust him with my wallet. I do trust him with my wallet. Um, <laughs> And uh, he's been very supportive and an excellent sounding board. Um, I also have to introduce my friend Stan Chukuba. Um, on February 22nd, 2009, I got an email. It's one of the peculiarities of my job. I get emails from people. I get calls from people I don't know. They've read something I've read. Some of them are lamb lambasting me for what an idiot I am. Um, some are complimentary. Stan's email was both. <laughs> um, he, he read Gusher of Lies. He was highly complimentary. And he said, uh, but then he said on page 217, I mistook power and energy. I, 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 I confused them. And he said, graciously, he said, I know that you know better, but the proofreaders did not. <laughs> well, obviously, I didn't know. And several hundred emails that we've exchanged since then, I just met Stan just a few minutes ago for the first time. He proofread Power Hungry numerous times. But more importantly, he patiently tutored me in physics and math. And it was what I needed at the time that I needed it. Uh, and he's never asked for anything in return. He's only just said, look, I want you to get it right. He's an expert on the system of international units. He's a native of Moravia. He's lived in the US since 1969. I owe him a lot. So if you would please a hand for my friend Stan Jakuba. A brief word on joining the Manhattan Institute. Um, I'm as surprised as anybody to be standing up here. I come from the liberal left, and to be joining an, a think tank that I would say leans right surprises me as much as anyone else. But now, after doing the work that I've done on this book and other books, the left-right divide bores me. The liberal conservative, the Democrat-Republican divide bores me. I want to be with the smart people. And being with the Manhattan Institute clearly puts me with a lot of smart people. OK, so uh, my brief bio. I'm 49 years old. I was born and raised in the oil capital of the world, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, or at least it was briefly the oil capital of the world for about 15 minutes. Since, a child I've been, since I was a child, I've been fascinated by the energy business. My dad sold insurance. He wasn't in the, in the energy business, but he had a lot of friends who were in energy. And I would talk to them, and they were working in Iran. They were working in Panama. They were working all over the world. And as a kid growing up in the provinces, I thought, wow, it's really an international business. And it's fascinating. And it is fascinating. And it captivates me today as much as it did uh, when I was a child. I mentioned I come from the liberal left. I make no apology about that. But when it comes to energy, I'm a liberal who got mugged by the laws of thermodynamics. <laughs> <laughs> You can't come to this business, you can't come to analyze this business with preconceived political notions about what the answer should be. Our energy and power delivery systems are not determined by carbon content or political correctness. They are determined by basic physics and basic math. I have the best job of anybody I know. 
I have the best family of anybody I know. But when it comes to professional business, I get to read about, write about, think about, travel the world a little bit to, to learn more about the energy business, which to me is by far and away the world's most fascinating business. From the drill bit to the spark plug, from politics to economics, um, geopolitics, technology, every part of it fascinates me. And I, even though I've been at it for a while, I still feel as though I'm just a rank beginner. Another reason why it fascinates me, it is by far and away the world's biggest business. Five trillion dollars a year, at least, are spent every year finding, refining, and delivering energy and power to consumers. What's five trillion dollars? It's approximately, well it's greater than, rather, the gross domestic product of China. This isn't big business, it is enormous business. My second point. Density is green. I don't care whether you're talking about urban populations such as the one here in New York, or you're talking about agricultural production on a farm in Nebraska, or you're talking about power production from a nuclear power plant or a gas stripper well. Density is green. We want to use density because it, it allows us to use our resources, land, steel, concrete, in the most efficient manners. As my friend Jesse Ausubel, who's a director of the program for the human environment at, the Rockefeller, at Rockefeller University here in town, he's also with the Sloan Foundation, and he's been a great uh, friend and tutor to me as well. I was talking about uh, this issue with him the other day, and he put it this way, I thought it was very clever. He said, high yields are the best friend of nature. Now let me focus on the issue of power density for a moment because this is absolutely critical. And it's one that's an issue that Stan Jakuba really helped me understand um, because when you, when you think about power and energy delivery systems, power density, and it's, I write about it in the book, it's one of what I call the four imperatives. Power density, energy density, cost, and scale. Power density refers to the energy flow that can be harnessed from a given unit of volume, area, or mass. So whether we're talking, if we're talking about the weight of an engine, how many horsepower, that would be a measure of, 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 of power density in mass. But the key issue for us as we talk about our different solar, wind, nuclear, et cetera, is aerial power density. What are the area requirements for certain power systems? And this, if I was going to brag about any of the numbers in the book, I think it's this set of numbers regarding power density and comparing wind turbines to those of other standard forms of power generation. Average wind turbine has a power density of about 1.2 watts per square meter. You can also calculate it in horsepower per acre if you prefer, but it's the same, same aerial metric for power density. So how does wind energy then compare to other conventional forms? This is the shocking fact. Even a gas stripper well producing 60,000 cubic feet per day, the definition of a stripper well, has a power density of 28.6 watts per square meter. That's 23 times as great as the power density of the wind turbine. Even a marginal oil well producing just two barrels per day, which in the oil field is the ragged edge of profitability, even with prices at 60 or $70. That that oil stripper well producing just two barrels a day has a power density of five and a half watts per square meter, four times that of a wind turbine. Now what about a nuclear power plant? Well, I use the South Texas project near my, in, in Austin, it's outside of Austin, 150 miles southeast. I use that as my example and I count the entire footprint for the whole plant, 19 square miles. Even if you count the entire 19 square miles, an area approximately, well, a little bit smaller than the island of Manhattan, that power, that power density of the South Texas project is 56 watts per square meter, which is 46 times that of a wind turbine. So let me sketch this out a little bit more for you because this is the key issue here when we talk about power density. So I said the South Texas project, 2,700 megawatts is the rated output of this power plant, two reactors, 2,700 megawatts, covers 19 square miles, as I said, about the size of the island of Manhattan. Let's say we want to produce that 2,700 megawatts with wind turbines. Okay, fine. Wind turbines are the political darling of the moment. To do that, you would need 900 square miles or a land area 